So I've been learning lots of things about cluster analysis, and in this video I want to talk to you about k-means, which is a very popular form of cluster analysis, but so far my least favorite. But I figured I'd show you what I've learned so far. I am by no means an expert in this area. I'm just logging what I've learned. All right, k-means is a non-hierarchical clustering approach. Uh, if you want to know the difference between hierarchical and non-hierarchical, you can go to Wikipedia or go to Joseph Hare's book on multivariate data analysis. In this video, I'm just going to show you how to do it and how to interpret it and make some sense out of the analysis. Now, the first thing we need to do in a k-means is make sure we're working with roughly equal uh, amplitudes in our variables. I have a bunch of data here on burgers and sandwiches from various restaurants, and I'd like to cluster them based on their calories, total fat, and sodium. Now these are on very different scales. We have 400, 300, hundreds for the calories, tens and teens and twenties for the total fat, and the sodium gets up into the thousands. So it would be very useful to standardize these prior to doing our k-means analysis. So I'm going to do that first. Go to Analyze, Descriptive, oops, Descriptives, and you're going to save standardized values as variables. And I'm just going to take these top three that I'm interested in, throw them over here. Don't care about anything else right now. I'm just creating standardized variables. Again, make sure that's checked. Hit OK. And you'll notice if you go back to your data set, you now have three new variables at the very end called ZZZ with a variable name. And now they are standardized with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So they're on roughly equal scales. And now if we go to a k-means analysis, it'll make a little bit more sense. Go to Analyze, Classify, k-means. Notice there's also two-step, which I've made several videos on, and Hierarchical, which I just made another video on. We're going to go to k-means, which is a non-hierarchical method. All right, let me just reset all this. I'm going to throw in calories. Oh, not these three, because those are non-standardized. I'm going to go down to here, get these standardized ones, throw them in. I'd like to label cases by sandwich, so I know where each sandwich lies. And let's look at these options here. We have iterate. We, If we can't converge in 10 iterations, then we probably don't have good data for clustering. Saving this option, this cluster membership option, allows you to save which cluster each sandwich belongs to. Um, it'll create a new variable column uh, at the very end of your data set that has that cluster membership number. Um, I'll click this just so you can see what it does. The distance from this cluster center is useful for subsequent analyses. Um, I'm not going to use it in this video. Options. Initial cluster centers, sure, although I'm not going to pay any attention to that. The ANOVA table I find very important. And uh, this cluster information I'm not going to include because um, it's in the saved cluster membership member already. I'm going to exclude cases list-wise. Continue and iterate and classify. Do I want to read cluster centers from another file? The answer is no. This is sort of an advanced option. What this allows you to do is if you've aggregated your data based on cluster numbers prior to doing a k-means analysis, um, then you can then test that initial cluster center that you provide against the initial cluster centers um, or the final cluster centers that it derives, and then you can see if it's a stable set of clusters. I'm not going to do that in this video. Just going to hit OK. Oh, I forgot one more thing. Sorry. Let's go back to it. Everything's the same. Um, you can specify the number of clusters. I'm going to say three because I think two is boring. Let's go to three. You can specify as many as you want. Just know that the more you specify, the smaller your clusters will be, and the more difficult, uh, typically, it will be to make sense out of them. Uh, if you specify only two, you'll typically get a high and a low. If you specify three, you'll get a high, a medium, and a low. If you specify four, you'll get some um, variation. So I'm going to go with three. It gives us a little bit more information. Hit OK. And you can play around with that. Try multiple solutions and see what you come up with. All right, I'm going to skip these first two here, go down to these final cluster centers. Now, what this tells us is how far apart each of, hmm, how to say this properly? This is probably a better way to say it. 
uh, it gives us the relative amplitude or center of the cluster or the average value for the variable here. So, for example, on a standardized scale, uh, cluster 1 has higher calories than cluster 2 or cluster 3. Um, cluster 2 has the lowest as a negative value here on a standardized scale. If you want to see how this looks in a more visual format, you double click it and then highlight all, this, all the middle cells here. Right click, create graph. You can visualize it a number of different ways. I think the easiest way is probably through a bar graph. Although the area graph looks really cool. I just can't figure out how to interpret it. And here we go. Here's a visual look at um, these clusters. Kind of small on the screen. Let me copy this out and paste it into a Word document. Let's get rid of this one here. And here we go. We can zoom in. And we see blue is calories, green is fat, and beige or tan is sodium. And we have cluster 1, 2, and 3 here. So for cluster 1, we see that we have the highest values for calories, fat, and sodium. Whereas for cluster 2, we have the lowest. These are negative, less than 0 uh, z-scores. And then for cluster 3, we have somewhere in between. So that's where these all lie. Um, and how these variables were used in order to determine which cluster each sandwich landed in. Now, another way we can look at uh, the importance of each variable in determining cluster is by looking at the ANOVA table. We can see by looking at this F score, or this F statistic, um, the relative weight given to a particular variable in order to determine which cluster a sandwich or a row in your data set um, was allocated to. So in all these cases, we can see that the F value is, is very large, uh, above a standard 2.58 or 1.96. Um, these are very large F values, all significant, indicating that all three of these variables had a significant impact on determining which cluster a sandwich was allocated to. Um, we'll come back to this. I'm going to throw in a bunch more variables, and you see some of them won't be useful in determining cluster membership. This last one here just tells us uh, the distribution. So we only had 14 sandwiches land in this high uh, calorie, high fat, high sodium cluster. Most sandwiches fall somewhere in number two, which is the low sodium, low fat, low uh, calorie sandwiches. And then um, about half fall into this third cluster. Let's go do this one more time, but I'm going to throw in several more variables. Ooh, I'll need to transform, I'll need to standardize them first. So let's go do that real quick. Descriptives, descriptives, we've already standardized these three. Let's grab, let's see, um, saturated fat, fiber, sugar, and protein. I'm going to actually undo saturated fat there. All right, let's throw those three in, save as standardized. They are saved, go to k-means, throw in these new three right here and just run it just like we had it before. I just added these new three um, standardized variables just so that we can go look here at the ANOVA table. Well, looks like they were all important, <laughs> but some less important in determining um, factor. So if we look at fiber and sugar, we see that these have a much lower F value than these others up here. And if we go to these cluster centers, we can see that uh, visually. So let me create a graph, go to the bar chart, and if we look at what were the two that weren't fiber and sugar, so fibers purple, sugars yellow, um, well they do look pretty different and again we have significant um, Z, uh, F values here so they do determine differences. Um, interesting. Now if we were to increase the number of factors, let's say to six, I'm just guessing here, we might end up with, nope, still awesome, oh well. Well, in some cases, <laughs> in some cases, you'll have variables that aren't significant um, contributors uh, or influencers into uh, determining which cluster a 
row will um, be allocated to. And in such cases, you are justified in removing that variable because it's not helping you uh, predict cluster membership. Lastly, uh, for no purpose but to show something super cool, I'm going to highlight all this information, right-click it, go to Create Graph, and Show Area. I just think these look really slick. Um, I really haven't figured out how to interpret them yet, but they look pretty cool. Well, that's all I have for now. If I learn more about factor or about uh, cluster analysis and k-means analysis, I will make another video. I almost forgot. Sorry, one more thing. You're not rid of me yet. We saved a cluster membership number. In fact, we ran this so many times, we probably saved several cluster membership numbers. So if we go to the end of our data set here, you can see we will have no cluster membership numbers. Well, that's embarrassing. Those should really be there. Let me see if I selected that. Save. Ah, I didn't check it. Here we go. Cluster membership number. Save. Um, let's just cut that back down to three. Hit OK. And... I'm just going to go back to our data set, and you'll see we have a new variable here, QCL. That's the cluster membership number. And you'll see that row one, oops, the Arby's Q sandwich, belongs to cluster one. And then you have cluster two, cluster one, one, two, two, three. Um, you'll only see values one, two, and three here because we only had three clusters. If you'd like, there's probably a way to uh, visualize that. I haven't come up with a way yet. But there you have it. If you want to know now if clusters are different based on their membership, I mean, if, if sandwiches are different based on their membership in a cluster, you can do that. For example, if we were to do an ANOVA, let's see, compare means, ANOVA, and using as the factoring variable this cluster membership number. And then we can go look at something like saturated fat, which we didn't even analyze. Throw that in there. Um, and protein, let me throw that in there just for fun. And hit OK. We can see in the Synova table that there are significant differences between clusters um, when you consider saturated fat and protein. So there you have it. That's how you use a cluster membership number.